interested in joining us on the show today, we have Al Gatmatan and Ramesh Balakrishnan. Uh, they are the co-CEOs of Up Health. Up Health is merging with Gig Capital 2. That ticker is G-I-X. Welcome to the show, gentlemen. Thanks a lot, Chris. I think we're off of mute now. Can there you we go. Us? We can hear you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good morning. Good morning, morning. Perfect. How are you? Good morning. Good morning, guys. Welcome, welcome to the show. Uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do like I usually do. I'm gonna step out while Chris asks some questions, and I'll be back with some of my own. Sounds good. All right, and it looks like Al, we're having a little bit of audio trouble with you. Are you able to hear us at all? All right, uh, Ramesh, if we can start with you here, I hope I'm saying that correctly. Yeah, you are, you are. Okay, perfect. So let's talk up health. So first, I'm wondering if we can get a little background um, on yourself uh, in this field. Sure, sure. Yeah, so so my background is, uh, so I've come into up health from having founded one of the companies that are part of the combination, right? A, a company called Thracis Inc. based in San Francisco, technology company. Um, we've been building and deploying software and healthcare for over 10 years, both internationally and the US. And so my background in healthcare specifically was deploying solutions for um, combined payers and provider networks in global markets and you know getting a, a sense of a wide range of how we have organized health systems different models uh what works what doesn't work and where the future is headed globally so that specifically with healthcare in terms of training my background um uh you know i started out with the uh, degrees uh, an undergraduate degree in engineering from the university of madras did my graduate work uh Masters and PhD at Stanford uh, came out, uh, you know, been a part of the Valley for for a long time, building uh, mission critical solutions really in a number of industries, and uh, started the focus on healthcare with the founding of Thracis, which is coming into into Up Health. Perfect, Al. Can you can you hear us? I Still don't think like we're Al having can... problems with the audio there. Let me text him. Uh, uh, we can keep going, uh, uh, Chris. Um, all right, perfect. So, you know, uh, we talk about SPACs on the show all the time, obviously, and we also talk traditional IPOs. So, you know, why the decision to go public via SPAC instead of a traditional IPO route? So a couple of couple of factors in that, uh, Chris, and it's part of the founding of, of UpHealth. Um, so one of uh, one relevant uh, fact here is that the chairman of UpHealth, uh, Chiranjeev Kathuri, who's a doctor, got an MBA from Stanford as well. Uh, he was responsible for taking one of the first telemedicines, telemedicine companies public, uh, NITOC, in, uh, in 2006. And uh, uh, over the last several years, we were talking about creating sort of this digital health super company that would include all of the core components to support moving to this new model of health. And the idea was that we would put this together, not from scratch, but take companies that had leading innovative uh, presence in the market, bring them into up health, and then um, find growth capital to accelerate uh, uh, expansion into the market. And as we were doing this, we were starting to see the, um, uh, some digital health companies go public, obviously Teladoc, but you know, a Capsule, many of these companies going public, some consolidations happening. And our sense was uh, that we would uh, benefit, uh, the primary intent here being to get growth capital and accelerate entry into the market by accelerating the going public. And uh, about the same time, we had built up a relationship with Gig Capital Two that deep experience in, in uh, public markets, a uh, great partner. And so all of this sort of came together as the ideal way to do what we were trying to do, which is accelerate the growth of companies that had already established 
a very strong presence in the market and um, raise capital uh, for that expansion and go public. And then that, that was the reason. And, and with the combination of, of gig capital, that worked out perfectly for us. Perfect. Good morning, Al. Are you able to hear us now? I am. Can you hear me? We can hear you we fine. Hear you, yes. well, welcome to the show, Al. Thank you. Apologize for the de delay, please. Let's continue. Not a problem. Not a problem. So, you know, I guess I'll turn it to you, Al. So, you, you know, with this merger, there's there's several components. Can you kind of break down for us, um, you know, the the it looks like four of the fastest growing digital health markets will be part of this merger. Uh, can you kind of break down those different growth areas for us? Yes, absolutely. Uh, we really wanted to mirror the markets that our major end users are dealing with. You know, beyond a simple point-to-point -point solution, we find the major end users, health systems, health plans, government agencies, ministries, they deal with the whole patient one at a time and a population of patients. So the four markets that we feel are the most dynamic to be in that can help power their transformation is integrated care management, which goes beyond the traditional population health or chronic condition management, it really offers a technology layer that collects, collaborates, and connects and, and empowers clinical and community care teams to care for a population of patients. E-pharmacy, our solution there is much beyond the retail fulfillment of a prescription, although we do that really well. The license in all 50 states with a mature product that more importantly goes up the value stream, positioning the pharmacist as a close partner with the patient and the physician, offering compounded and other personalized prescriptions. So that's a very powerful next step in that pharmacy journey. Uh, Global telehealth is represented domestically by CloudBreak, which is already established in over 1,800 care venues. Originally a language and interpretive services modem, but it's being repurposed to be a broad telehealth solution within the, the health system, uh, not just from the health system to the home. And then by globally, we're very excited about GlowCal, which has uh, completely reshaped and created, quite honestly, the new digital healthcare encounter where a complete physical exam, physician diagnosis, laboratory testing, and pharmacy dispensing can be all done in one digital encounter. The remarkable blend of technologies with re-engineering of workflows. And then the behavioral health space, again, a major element of the total healthcare spend, we're focusing on blended hybrid solutions, because again, we're going deeper into the value chain, more severe, more moderate, moderate to severe conditions that need a physical presence, but it augmented with, with teleconsult to extend those rare uh, providers that we know we're in shortage. So those are the four primary markets, quite large. Our customer base, again, is health systems, health plans, and government agencies and or national ministries. Awesome, what a great you know summary of all those different business units and components as part of this deal. Um, Ramesh, I want to turn back to you. So, you know, the, the thing that stands out or may stand out to investors is the, the telemedicine part of it. As you know, yeah. you mentioned, you know, Teladoc obviously is, you know, a, a prime example. We've seen them go public. We've seen that stock, you know, take off. Can, can you address, you know, just the, the overall growth market of telemedicine and maybe where we see that going over the next couple of years? Sure, sure, Chris. So I think there's a couple of different models here, uh, Chris, and it's important to understand them. There's one model of uh, telemedicine, which are companies that are really technology enabled medical groups. And what they try to do is build a off to the side, separate network of providers, reach out directly to patients in a B2C type of model and support a virtual episodic encounter, very convenient, et cetera, but really not connected up with local healthcare where most of the patient provider relationships already are. So that's one model. Um, I think that that model uh, has had uh, rapid adoption largely because of circumstances around the pandemic and other uh, you know, openings of windows that may not be sustainable in the long term. Our uh, belief here is that uh, what's going to happen long-term with telehealth is 
it's going to be another modality for local healthcare that already has the contracted physicians and provider networks and the patients already and that relationship there another modality to evolve local health care into new models of care which is what we're focusing on you know so if you look at uh, the up health model is really around uh, bringing these digital health technologies to enable local health care where the funds are where the providers are where the patients are to move into these new models of care that is that is massive and i think what we'll see with telehealth is all of these technologies and all of these innovations really starting to drive towards a, a different model of care you know how do we deliver services how do we manage health but um connected to and part of the local healthcare system where a community-based systems where most of uh, patients and providers and health plans will still um, uh, be the focus of that. All right, so I'm gonna jump in here for a, a little question here. It's, it's actually jumping on kind of what you just said. Um, so I'll bring the investor, investor presentation here. And, and like you, pointed out here. One thing I'd point out is not just only telehealth, you know, integrated care management, digital pharmacy and behavior health. You know, a lot of interest has been on, uh, you know, kind of teledoc and, and you guys saw how that company reacted. But one thing that I clearly state is, is where here, you know, up health is, is placed kind of dead in the center here and, and, and having their footprint in all these markets. How is that really going to uh, affect the company Al? Yes, well, we feel on, on several levels, it's a true, true strength and differentiator. First, we're diversified. So our each, each vertical, we have distinct business plans and growth plans, initially led by our international and integrated care management divisions. But all four have distinct diverse uh, customer groups and revenue streams and revenue models. A SaaS-based model with a blend of tech service-based revenue model. So the diversification is key, but the real power is what Mish was alluding to, which is this, the, the, the digital wave that has happened so far has not fundamentally reshaped healthcare. The, the, the average day of a provider of a patient hasn't fundamentally changed and, and delivery model is similar to what it's been for many, many years. So by being in all four areas and, and being able to integrate that over uh, a single patient and provider relationship or over a population of patients and a group of providers and being able to offer that unified platform to the major end users. That's where uh, our strength lies and where we believe the real opportunity is uh, to power the, the, the existing health systems and health plans digital transformation. Perfect. And, you know, so I want to turn, one of you already mentioned it, you know, the international aspect of this company. So Ramesh, you know, turn to you here, you know, um, as we talk about competition and differentiating factors, you know, I want to focus on that international footprint. There's that slide right there. Um, can you talk a little bit about how that's, you know, a, a positive with UpHealth and this deal going forward, the international footprint? Sure, sure, Chris. Uh, what we're doing in the international market is, is quite uh, revolutionary and, and a really tremendous breakthrough, Chris, because what we're doing is we're packaging uh, in a kiosk or mini clinic form factor, we're packaging a complete digital exam. So this is a telehealth consult, a connected IoT, um, including imaging, you know, fetal Dopplers, etc. We're packaging complete labs in a, in a machine, sort of lab in a box, where you can do labs, get results in 15 minutes, as well as pharmacy dispensing. All of this packed into a kiosk clinic format, and we're deploying these uh, as a very affordable, scalable infrastructure to build, bring access to healthcare where none exists uh, today. And we're signing, we've signed contracts with 10 countries, uh, just launching a big, uh, contract in Madhya Pradesh in India, where, you know, uh, when this 
is rolled out, we'll be doing you know nine, 10 million visits a year just in that one province alone. So um, this, you know, the, the healthcare is a global infrastructure need. Um, uh, there isn't access in many parts of the world and these old models of building large hospitals, large capital intensive and technology poor um, uh, places for receiving healthcare at these digital technology poor is, is a thing of the past. And what we're pioneering is a new model for how you can rapidly deploy connected uh, points of care uh, that are affordable, easy to deploy, and can start to service, you know, really hundreds of millions, billions of, of people worldwide uh, with access to care. The majority of our revenues, Chris, will remain domestic, but clearly the, the, glo the local global solution is fast growing. And we really do see that it has potential applications in the Western world, the US, or healthcare deserts, rural areas, urban uh, vulnerable communities. So it's, it's a remarkable solution that uh, is solving a huge problem with healthcare disparities internationally. And we do see uh, domestic applications. Awesome. So, you know, Al, um, you know, I go through that investor presentation. I did see some, you know, partnerships, some, you know, key. Uh, you know, hospitals signed. Can you talk a little bit, you know, about some of those key customers and partnerships that are in place and maybe how that can impact, um, you know, predictable recurring revenue going forward? Absolutely. That That's another strong uh, strength of uh, UpHealth is its established customer base. We have 1,800 U.S. care venues contracted. We have thousands of physicians utilizing our pharmacy system and the largest public U.S. health plan. So uh, what we like about that is that gives us multiple points of entry into the main end users that we have already established. And our vision is to introduce a more unified, expanded platform of services. So a health system that may be using CloudBreak's uh, health solution will have a strong interest in the integrated care management if they're in a risk model. Uh, they may hopefully have a strong interest in our behavioral health solutions going forward. So I look at those, the customer base is first of all, very uh, impressive, it covers coast to coast. It's a national customer base. Uh, we do have significant recurring revenues in our telehealth and our integrated care management uh, model. And we have great visibility into future contracts. Uh, but more importantly, they're, they're, they establish us already with a strong beachhead from where we can expand the offerings to the major users. Perfect. So, uh, you know, Ramesh, turning back to you, you know, we just heard Al talk about, you know, some of that predictable recurring revenue. Um, so outside of, you know, that that predictable revenue, how, how do you look at making projections for overall, you know, revenue going forward? And what can investors in this company, you know, expect in terms of annual growth and profitability going forward? Sure, Chris. So, so the first thing to point out is that we're already profitable, Chris, and uh, we're already operating at uh, a little around $115 million of revenue as of 2020. Uh, and if you look at our revenue model, uh, there there is this recurring revenue stream from contracts, and then there is a revenue stream from referral sources for uh, prescribers for medications, behavioral health services, uh, and these we're increasing the portions of the revenue that are contracted revenues. But if you look at the numbers that we've put out there in terms of growth in 21, these are really coming substantially from expansion of uh, the contracts that we have. So um, there's very strong, uh, it's a sort of a bottoms up projection of revenues for 21 and 22 that are based on the contracts we have and kind of built in growth of those contracts and a very strong pipeline where we're already the vendor of choice uh, and are completing out the contract. So uh, what I think investors can see is uh, that we're making conservative projections. They're based on the continued growth of these businesses that have been established over multiple years and a growth trajectory that is accelerated largely by growth capital. 
what we're not factoring in here is the very large upside that comes from bundling these uh, offerings to our existing customer base and expanding that dollar volume per customer from doing that. And all of the synergies that are built into um, uh, the, you know, bringing the one up health platform as a bundled offering to market. It's perfect. So, you, you know, part of the, the SPAC process, right, is you're, you're trying to get investors to hop on board, invest in the, the future of the company. So we heard a lot, you know, about the, the growth uh, domestically, internationally. I know this is going to be a, a hard task, but, you know, I'll start with you, Al. What do you think, you know, if, if, if you had to, you know, talk about this company, you know, just briefly to possible investors, what do you think the key focus area should be for them? Well, I, I believe our differentiating factor is the fact that we are already profitable and we have strong visibility into our future revenues and profitability. And that's coming from, again, this established base of customers. Up Health is not a startup enterprise. It comprised of technologies that have been developed for 10 plus years, companies that have meticulously paid attention to the fundamentals of how do you build a sound company. And that we're able to execute on our vision through a various uniquely qualified list group of leadership, both is experience, deep experience within the healthcare delivery system, experience with scale, and most importantly, truly novel experience on advanced technologies and introducing them into the marketplace. We believe something that is a unified platform that represents the next generation of, tele, of digital healthcare requires such a, a diverse a mix of leadership skills, and we have that as well. So uh, novel technologies to pay attention to, our ongoing profitability that is a sound base for us going forward, and an experienced, uh, highly capable leadership team to lead, the, lead forward to make sure we fulfill our potential. Awesome. And then uh, Ramesh, same question for you. What do you think you know, the, the key summary points are for possible investors in health? I think that the key summary points uh, to add on to what uh, Al already said is we're building a digital health leader here uh, that is focused on a long term uh, understanding of the healthcare industry and being a partner to healthcare in the digital transformation. So these are trends that are long term, not not uh, you know short term openings caused by the pandemic. We're a global company, we're technology innovators, and we understand the new model of care that is emerging, not just in the US, but globally as well. Another important fact to keep in mind is that all of these founding companies have rolled over uh, you know, about 92% of equity into UpHealth. So we're not here for the short term either. We're, uh, nobody here is looking to flip anything. We are here to build a long, valuable company. Uh, we have a sense of mission about this. Uh, healthcare is broken. Uh, everybody has had the experience of that. We think we know where it needs to go and we have some of the core technologies and offerings to take it there. Uh, and we're here to do that uh, because it's uh, it does a lot of good and there's a lot of hardship uh, uh, being, uh, you know, people face unnecessarily from the way things are. And so there's the, the mission to build a company that does good and becomes very valuable on very solid fundamentals. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and jump in here and bring in what I always like to pull out here. So let's go ahead and take a look here at the financial benchmarking to the peers. And what I'm really trying to look at is the EBITDA. You know, the, the peer mean is, is 2.9. Um, and you can see there's a lot of kind of ups and downs here, but th this you guys have here on, on the predicted for the uh, 2021 12.4. And, and to kind of expand a little bit on that, um, I, I'd like to look at integrated care management. And one thing I'd point out here is the 2020 number here at 31% of the business line. Um, my question here would be, uh, when I look at revenue, I see that it came about 16%. Why are we getting that kind of the higher rate there on the EBITDA from integrated care management? And is, is there some bigger opportunities there to kind of 
uh, expand on. I'll, I'll first go yeah, to yeah, Al. Yeah, sure. Oh, let's go first. Let's let's go first to Al, and then we'll go we'll go over here. Sure. Well, my first opening would be the integrated care management is uh, essentially a SaaS based revenue model. So margins there are inherently higher. And so when that business grows as a proportion to the total revenues, and Ramesh can elaborate more on that growth strategy, it naturally elevates our EBITDA. So that's why you see the EBITDA going from 12 to today to 20%, because the bulk of our near term growth is in the integrated care management and our global. Uh, solutions, which are uh, very much recurring revenue, SaaS type revenues. Ramesh can describe more about the growth we're projecting in the near term. Okay, Ramesh, so, uh, we'll go to you. Yes, yeah, so I, I think to uh, Al put his finger on it, the integrated care management is a SaaS offering technology platform. There's massive uh, upside to rolling that out. You know, we've had some very significant wins over. Uh, leading incumbents uh, in deploying the integrated care platform. Uh, so we haven't factored, uh, you know, what we can do with growth capital fully uh, to expand on those revenues. But what we're doing on that uh, with the integrated care management is we're creating these virtual care communities that we can sort of wrap around our existing customer who becomes an anchor, whether that's a hospital, health plan, physician group, they become the anchor to a virtual care community we sort of wrap around them and the model there is a global network of interconnected care communities that are deploying this new model of care enabled with the digital technologies and that's a massive upside opportunity to doing that i mean our belief is that's where healthcare is going to end up but that that's the heart of what the integrated care ma management uh, strategy is is to enable these uh, interconnected virtual care communities where clinical and community-based teams can manage health um, in a model of care that looks at the whole person, medical, behavioral health, social factors. Yeah, I definitely have to agree uh, in, in the long term how, how we're moving further and further into integrated. So I appreciate that answer. So go ahead, Chris. I think we got uh, one or two from the chat and then we'll go ahead and wrap, guys. Yeah, perfect. Um, you know, questions I saw in the chat, I think we already touched on. It was talking about, you know, any update to the investor presentation. Um, you know, I heard you, Ramesh, talk about how, you know, estimates may be on the conservative side of things. So I think, you know, that's going to cover, you know, part of that. The, the question I'm seeing in the chat, you know, and I know this may be a tough one to get into is, you know, talking about that vote extension um, that we saw for GIX. So, wondering if you know you can both kind of comment on maybe where we stand on the timeline of getting this deal done so maybe you first al and then ramesh a follow-up well we're happy to report that the extension was uh secured with great enthusiasm and minimal minimal redemption of shares so we have that uh trust balance moving forward plus the 285 million dollars of convertible and prime uh, investors uh that's already in secure. So we're very excited about the, uh, the capital raise today. So the timing, uh, we have the SEC filing has been complete and we received comments from the SEC just this week. We'll be quickly turning those around and we're targeting uh, late April, early May for perhaps uh, our initial listing date. Perfect, anything to add there, Ramesh? No, nothing to add. That's okay. Something. Yeah. Perfect. Well, thank you for clearing that up with the timeline. You guys heard it here, you know, late April, early May. Um, you know, we look forward to following the progress of, you know, getting this merger done. I want to thank both of you for joining us on the show. Again, we have UpHealth co-CEOs. Um, that company is going public with Gig Capital 2. The ticker is GIX. Thank you both so much for joining us, you know, and taking the time out of your busy schedule. Thank you very much, both of you. Thanks Thank you. very much. Thank, Thank you. you. You guys have a great day.